For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon DeRayhove. I'm with Chandra Gould of the Institute for Security Studies, who will discuss why apartheid planning continues to undermine the efforts of crime reduction. You mentioned that inequality is one of the social factors that have been identified as contributing to high rates of crime. Can you tell us more? There have been many studies conducted internationally um, about the extent to which inequality is responsible for high rates of violent crime. And I think that in South Africa there's also been research done that looks at the relationship between inequality and violent crime in particular. Most recently is research that was done by Michael O'Donovan that was presented at our international conference at the end of last year. And what Michael was showing is that just talking about inequality at a national level is not really helpful to understanding the relationship between inequality and violent crime. But what he was showing is that if you have a look at the relationship between areas that are rich and poor and their proximity to one another, you do find a correlation between that and high levels of violent crime. In other words, the, what Michael was saying is the existence of areas of pockets, if you like, of richness next to pockets of poorness is one of the factors that contributes to high levels of violent crime. Research shows that there's a correlation between average precinct income and crime rates, with low income rates corresponding to low crime rates. Yet it is low income and unemployment that is blamed for the high crime rate. What's the story here? I think it's incorrect to blame poverty or to blame high unemployment levels for crime. I think what the data is telling us is that the, the relationship is far more complex than that. And I think if you look at the work that is done, being done by the ISS, that's been done by the Centre for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, and by others at the MRC, looking at violent expressions of masculinity, for example, you'll find that there's a relationship between the way in which people behave and their, pers their perspective, particularly men, and their, their ability to express their masculinity in a functional kind of way. So if you break that down into what that really means, mm. it really means that particularly boys who grow up in an environment are where crime is normalized, where there's a, perhaps a high level of, or a high acceptance of violence and crime, they, and who don't believe that they have terribly much hope for the future and aren't able to find, ex put themselves out as successful men in the world, they might be more likely to res resort to crime, which will bring them the kind of income that they need in order to be able to express themselves as, as successful men. So I think what we're finding, and this is, this is not unique to South Africa in any way at all, is that the relationship between unemployment, employment, poverty and crime is a deeply complex one. There are a number of other factors happening. So you can't say that because you have high levels of poverty, you'll have high levels of violent crime. I mean, we see countries like India where that's just not the case. So there's something else happening here. And I think that's what we're trying to understand. Professors Keith Suthill and Brian Francis have said that the pivotal issue is whether people are able to develop internal controls to resist crime. The development of more prisons is a measure of the failure to do this. This is not how we usually talk about crime in South Africa. Do you think we will be able to shift the focus from policing to where people in South Africa are internally motivated to avoid doing crime? I don't think that that's a process that happens overnight. And I think that what we see from international experience is that transitions to democracy are accompanied very often by a rise in violent crime after the transition. Now I know we talk about the fact that our transition happened 15 years ago and we expect a lot to change in 15 years, but really 15 years is not a very long time for social processes to take place and to be completed. I think there are other factors as well playing into our acceptance as cr of criminality in South Africa. I think it's absolutely vital that we have good examples of leadership um, and addressing corruption at, at, at high level is one of the things we really need to look at doing very seriously. Um, but I think that what ultimately building a healthy society does involve having a shared vision having shared interests 
And I think this comes to, to the very issue that uh, Michael O'Donovan was talking about and this relationship between inequality and crime and so on. So that if we have, if rich and poor have the same interests, and if we have the same interests in terms of micro issues where we live, so we, if we live on the sa lived on the same street, or if we lived in the same neighborhood and our children went to the same schools, there would be a kind of social cohesion that comes out of that because we have shared interests that would mitigate against the kind of cr property crime and violent crime that we see emerging as a consequence of inequality. You argue that one of the primary factors driving high levels of crime is inequality within an area, with separate development playing a big part. These are classic characteristics of apartheid town planning. How can South Africa move away from this and therefore lower the crime rate? Well, I think, first of all, it will be just one of the factors that will contribute to lowering crime rates. I think, you know, because crime is a complex problem, we're going to have to have multiple solutions. But I do believe we need to be very conscious of the kind of spatial development that we are um, facilitating. So most recently, this came to my attention in, in a peri-urban area where a development plan was produced for the area, a structure plan, looking at how to move people around. And in particular, this structure plan looked at clustering together um, low income and low income uh, groups and putting them in a particular area away from other high income groups. I think that's just really going contrary, that's repeating apartheid mm -hmm. planning. It's contrary to everything that's going to build social cohesion. In other words, when we're talking about developing new areas, we need to keep in mind that mixing people of different income groups up together is ultimately in our best interest socially. That's what's going to overcome some of the divides of the past and allow us to see each other as human beings um, and not reinforce divisions that are now, that are racial divisions as well as class divisions that need to be addressed very urgently. And I think the, one of the, it's very difficult in an urban setting, not impossible, but it's difficult to do integrated development like that in, a, in an urban setting. It's easier if we start looking at doing it in towns and in smaller places mm. where you don't have the same kind of structural constraints mm. um, of existing buildings and, and uh, suburbs and so on. So I think we really need to be very conscious of breaking down those barriers in our development. Donate now and give 15 rand a month. SMS JOIN to 41486.